not willpower, and, and it's not the ability to suck it up, get over it, or just say no. And we learned that the common understanding of self, self-control only leads to a hardening of yourself to everything. And self-control is the ability the Holy Spirit gives you to choose between the important thing and the urgent thing. See, the important thing is the greatest... The important thing is that the greatest thing you can do is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The urgent thing is following the urgent cravings of our sinful nature. And without the fruit of the Spirit called self-control, we will always choose the urgent thing over the important thing. And we talked about how do you get self-control. Well, we learned that you don't get self-control by giving God control of your life. I grew up with that phrase. My Sunday school teacher taught me that. I've heard pastors preach it, give God control of your life. I've heard that. And a revelation last week you know, that God doesn't want control of your life. See, God isn't a dictator who pushes a magic button to take over our free will. And this is the point. We voluntarily bring our lives and purposes into agreement with what he wants to accomplish. See, God gives us the power we need to master our flesh our appetites, our passion, and even our tongues. And that, but we have to voluntarily bring our lives and purposes into, in agreement with him. He doesn't want control. A lot of you, and a lot of us have grown up with that. Boy, God, give God control of your life. But he doesn't want control. He doesn't want to be a dictator in your life. He doesn't want to tell you what to do. He wants you to surrender and line up with him. Because when you surrender, when you give up, you know, that when, that's when God and the, and the work of his Holy Spirit can work in you. So you get self-control by voluntarily loving God with your life. We also learn that you don't get self-control by praying for it. You know, God, give me self-control. You know, you're walking around and, you know, in the grocery store, your mom, God, give me self-control. Well, he's not going to give it. You get self-control by praying for yourself, not about yourself, not praying to yourself, but praying for yourself. And when you pray this prayer I talked about last week, sincerely, when you pray, God have mercy on me, I am out of control, and you pray that sincerely, something supernatural begins to happen in you. Today, I'm not going to read the scripture because Jonathan read it. Uh, well, actually, Paul, I'm sorry. Paul read it uh, in the skit today. It comes from 1 Corinthians 13, talking about love is patient, love is kind, and love is not, is not proud. So I'm not going to repeat all of that. But let's do pray. Father God, thank you how you challenged us already and how your spirit has greeted us. May we open our ears that we can hear. May we open our eyes that we can see you. Amen. There's a story about an actor who is playing the part of Christ in the Passion Play in the Ozarks. And as he carried the cross up the hill, a tourist began hack heckling, making fun of him and shouting insults at him. Finally, the actor had taken all he could take, and right in the middle of the play, he threw down his cross, walked over to the tourist, and punched him out. (laughs) After the play was over, the director told him, I know he was a pest, but I can't condone what you did. Besides, you're playing the part of Jesus, and Jesus never retaliated. So don't you do anything like that again. Well, the man promised he wouldn't. But the next day, the heckler was back, worse than ever. And finally, the actor exploded again and punched him out again. The director said, that's it. I, I have to fire you. We, we can't have you behaving this way while playing the part of Jesus. And the actor begged. He said, please give me one more chance. I really need this job, and, and I can handle it. I can handle it if it happens again. So the director decided to give him one more chance. The next day, he was carrying his cross on, uh, up the street, And sure enough, the heckler was there again. You could tell that the actor was really trying to control himself. But it was about to get to the best of him. He was clenching his fist and grinding his teeth. And finally, he looked at the heckler and said, 
I'll meet you after the resurrection. <laughs> uh, oh. None of us in here were ever, <laughs> let's start all over here. None of us in here will ever be able to love like Jesus. Do you know that? None of us in here will ever be able to love like Jesus. And that's okay. But we can commit ourselves to love like Jesus. You know, a lot of times we, we talk about falling in love with someone or talk, falling in love with the person. And, and, and folks, do you know no one ever falls in love, contrary to popular belief? No one ever falls in love with a person. What happens as we commit to love them? We commit to love. We commit, our, we commit ourselves to figuring out ways to love them. And when you commit yourself to loving anybody, if you commit yourself to loving anybody, you begin to change the way you think. You begin to change the way you feel. You begin to change the way you do life. You see, because we as humans, and this is why it's impossible for us, to love like Jesus. We don't love naturally. Well, what do you mean? I love my wife. Well, yeah, you committed to love your wife, and you figured out all the last number of years how to love you. Am I right? Ladies, same with you. You figure out how to love this guy. You learn what patience is like. You know, you learn what long suffering is like. You've learned not to be rude in situations. We had to learn those things. And anybody who's just getting married, I tell them, you know what? You have no idea what it means to love one another. Oh, yeah, I know. I love him so much. I know all about him. You know, I hear that. Out of probably the past 100 weddings I've done, I've heard that 85 times. You know? Yes, that's 85 for, for those of you in math. And you learn, you commit. That's what marriage is, is you're making a commitment to love that person the rest of your life. You don't fall in love. Let's be honest. We're attracted to their body. Are we not, guys? <laughs> and ladies, you too. You just hide it better. We're attracted to them. It's called eros. It's called erotic love. God put it in us, and it's Okay. Because if they look good, wow, you're following them all the way, aren't you? But we don't love naturally, but, and loving God and, and loving others is, is, is a supernatural thing. You know, when I met my wife, something happened in me that goes beyond reason. And those of you who know that, you've experienced that. When I met her, something happened in me that goes beyond reason. My story is when she walked into the church, I knew I was going to marry her. I didn't even know her. Honest truth. Because I asked her to marry me about, ooh, four or five months later. I only met her parents twice. Once, I think. And the second time was, hey, I'd like to marry your daughter. You know, I just knew it. There was something that happened inside. I can't explain it to you. I can't explain it to her. You know, and I really can't describe what's happening in me. So obviously, you know, when you can't explain, you got to find a picture of it. And, and for all you, any Bambi fans out there that like to watch Bambi? Hold your hand up if you like to watch Bambi. Yeah? Okay, you guys, you just have to live with it today. But this is my favorite scene in the whole scene of Bambi because it explains what happened inside of me.
favorite part of the movie, right there. You know, it also happens in friendships. They're just certain people who you connect with more than others, and you can't explain it. It just happens. You know, like, and like Jonathan and David in the scriptures, you know, they have such a tight relationship, you, you can't explain it. And, and when I met Jesus for the first time at age 18, the same thing happened in me. I can't explain it, but, but, it, was something that, but it was something that happened in me that but to try to put it in the words wouldn't do it justice. I just know when I met him, when I met Jesus as my Savior, I began to think differently. I began to live differently. You know, just in that little clip, things change inside of you. As childish as that was, it's a vivid picture of what goes on inside of you because when you enter into a relationship, you know, either with that person who you had your eyes on for a long time and, and they say, yes, guys, isn't there something that happens inside of you? Yeah, there is. It's called your Twitter page. <laughs> and are we spiritually Twitter page? To where God is doing such a work in us that we can walk on air. That God is doing such a work in us that it can't be explained, not even by an owl and a bunch of animals. <laughs> but when I was 18, that's what has happened to me. And when you enter into any relationship and you're committed to love that person, something happens in you. And us guys, we just kind of, you know, nothing happened to me. Yeah, it did. You know, I drove all the way across town to take my wife's garbage out. Once a week, something happened in me. And something happens in you when you commit to love someone. And when you commit to loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Notice I use the word commit to love him. It doesn't mean you do it perfectly like we saw in this little skit. You commit to loving him. You commit to loving him with your heart, mind, and soul, and something begins to happen in you. Something begins to change in you, not in the other person. We want the other person to change because you know what? They're just not getting it right. No, you are the one to change. You are the one, you know, to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You are the one, not them, you. And when you commit to loving God, something happens in you that is totally unexplainable. Can you explain how you met those of you who are married or dating? Can you explain how you met that person and how that connection began to happen? You can't. Oh, you can tell the story, but you really can't explain what happened inside of you, can you? There's one day you looked at them and said, mm -hmm. man, they look good. Isn't that right? Yeah, they all of a sudden changed. You know? Something happened to you that you can't explain. And when you commit to loving God with your heart, mind, and soul, I mean commit to loving him, not your spouse, not your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your friend, your whoever, Paul and Danny at work, you know? But when you commit to loving him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, something begins to happen in you. And to commit ourselves to love like Jesus, like I've been talking about. And when you commit yourself to love anyone, and especially when you, commit our, when you commit yourself, when we commit ourselves to love like Jesus, uh, it, makes us, it makes ourselves uh, vulnerable, vulnerable to hurt, pain, and suffering. Don't you hate that? You, know, you love someone so much, and, uh, and all they do, all you, all, you just experience a lot of hurt, and you experience a lot of pain. C.S. Lewis said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Loving anything uh, loving anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. 
Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of or your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only, the only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all dangers of love is hell. <laughs> you see, hate, hurt, pain, and suffering are part of loving someone, part of loving God, part of loving another person. Hurt, pain, and suffering are going to come if you love at all. Hurt, pain, and suffering are going to come. I cried over my dog, which I didn't like. You know? But to throw dirt on top, I'm like, you know? If you're going to love someone, there's going to be hurt, pain, and suffering. And that includes loving God. There's going to be hurt, pain, and suffering. Even when you love God. And these hurt things, things, these very same things, this hurt, pain, and suffering, they could cause you to stop loving God, can't they? They could stop you. These hurt, some of them, you've experienced a lot of hurt and a lot of pain and suffering growing up. And that could also cause you, you know, to not soften your heart, but cause, your, cause you to stop loving God and others and harden your heart towards God and others. Folks, we just need the fact, to accept the fact of the reality uh, that, that, we're going, that people are going to hurt us. Those that we love are going to hurt us, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. And why does it hurt? Because we love them. Isn't that a revelation? Why you hurt for someone? It's because you love them. If you don't love them, you don't hurt. Right? If you harden your heart towards anything, you don't have to love them, and you don't have to hurt, you don't have to feel pain, and you don't have to suffer. Woo! Man, I'm not loving anybody anymore. If I have to hurt and have pain and suffer... What's the point in loving someone? Well, that's part of love. That's how you know you are loving someone. And I'm bold enough to say, if it doesn't hurt, then you are not loving them. Sometimes we can get so hurt, you know, that our heart grows hard to the point where we can't love them anymore. But if it doesn't hurt, then you're not loving them. Well, why didn't Jesus' heart grow hard towards God, his Father? He was hurt. He was wounded, hurt, wounded, more than, he, more than we will ever be hurt or wounded. Do you know that right? He went through more pain than we will ever go through. You know that right? He suffered more than we will ever suffer. Folks, he was abandoned by his father in a moment of need. So why didn't Jesus' heart go hard towards God? Get this, if you don't get anything else, because he loved his father and not what his father could do for him. Did you hear that? He loved his father. Not for what his father can do for him. And it's important that God, it's important to note, I think at this point, it's important to note that God loves us not, not, what we can, not for what we can do for him. There's nothing we can do to make him love us. He already does. There are no prerequisites. There are no conditions. He already has a relationship with you because he was there when you were knit together in your mother's room. And that's when the relationship began. When you were conceived, that relationship began right there. So there is no question. There's nothing you can do to make him love you. He already does. No conditions, no prerequisites. He already loves you. And the big question is, will you love him?
Do you love him? And will you open your heart to him? Will you be vulnerable in the presence of God? Will you cry out, God, I'm out of control? I'm a sinner who's out of control. Will you be vulnerable to him? Do you love him? Because he already loves you. I mean, make it about prerequisites and conditions, but there's nothing in the Bible that says that. Do you love him? Will you open up your heart to him? And it's also, it's important here to know that you really don't love God if you, if you expect him to do something for you. Do you know that? You really don't love him. You really don't love him if you expect for him to do something for you. And a lot of people have that mentality. That's not loving God, and you don't love him. He's not a genie in a bottle that will meet your top three needs. In actuality, he never promised to meet any of our needs. He only promised to be there. Show me. Show me where he promises to meet our needs. He only promises to be there because he is our need. You see, we need God. You know, we need God, you know, to get us the job we want, and we need God to provide us that significant other in our life. We need God to, to make the changes we need to make in our life. We need God to take our pain and heartache away. We need God to make our life better, and we need God to take control of our life and make it right. And he says, I don't want control of your life. I want you to surrender your life. But when you say, I need God, period, Everybody say that with me. That was fun. All right? You need to experience this this morning. Say with me, I need God. I need God, period. No, you got to put some emphasis on the period part. Ready? One, two, three. I need God, period. That's when the supernatural begins to happen. Nothing else, no one else, as we sang Christ alone. And the only need he meets is that need to be in relationship with him. Folks, I'm convinced none of this stuff really matters. Your job, your spouse, how good or bad you think you are, none of that matters. What matters is that you allow him to meet that deepest need, and that deepest need is him. Some of you have chased things all your life only to come to a dead end. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's right. Man, he's pretty smart. We chase after these things, whatever it may be, thinking that they're going to fulfill our deepest and wildest dreams and our hopes. Folks, none of those things will. Your kids are going to disappoint you. Your stuff is going to break. Your car is going to break down. Your money's going to go away. Your kids are going to steal it if you don't give it away. All that matters. We think we need that stuff, don't we? But oh, do you, but do you need him? Nothing else and no one else matters. See, Jesus had confidence that his father loved him. Even when they did mean and cruel things to him, the world did. God never stopped loving his son. And God never stopped loving him. Uh, during these times when they were happening to him, he didn't stop loving his son. And you can put your confidence in the fact, and you too can put your confidence in the fact that God will not stop loving you when others do mean and cruel things to you, when others break your heart, when others stab you in the back, when others say mean and cruel things about you, when others do mean, cruel things to you. He does not stop loving you. You can put your confidence in the fact that God will not stop. And understanding how much God loves me gives me confidence to love others. 
Folks, you know we don't love others naturally, right? We don't. We don't love others naturally. But understanding how much God loves me gives us, gives me, gives you confidence to love others. Now, how does it give confidence? <laughs> this is brilliant. I just, when I thought of this, man, it was totally the Holy Spirit thing because I could understand it. <laughs> how does it give confidence? Because you understand, because you understand that if God can love me, he can love anybody. Isn't that profound? Yeah, thank you. Two of you said yes. <laughs> Is that not profound? Let me say it again. Maybe you'll catch it. Because you understand if God can love me, he can love anybody. Any more than that? I'm looking. Thank you. Three more in the front row. One right there. Let me try one more time, see if I can get more. I'm going for 100% here. Because you understand if God loves me, he can love anybody. Wow. Thank you. You caught on. Because you're not any more special than the person next to you, even if they're a prostitute. He loves you just as much as he loves the prostitute and the tax collector. You are the one who thinks you're better than them. Am I right? You think you're better than a prostitute. Because, well, I don't sleep around with guys. Ladies, right? I'm a holy woman, you know? Because you understand if God loves me, it's how we get the confidence. He can love anybody. And loving others is the most important thing you and I can be doing. You know, last week we learned, and I said it here, that the most important thing is to love the Lord to God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when you love others, folks, get this. When you love others, you make yourself vulnerable. It, it, when you give them your heart, that, when you give them their heart, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Because they can crush it. They can abuse it. And they can take you for granted. It makes you vulnerable when you give them a heart. Because when you love someone, you, you begin to care about them. You begin, to, you begin to serve them. And when you serve them, you give them the opportunity to break your heart. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus healed people. Jesus fed people. Jesus did miracles for people. And what did they do to him? They gave him a party. On a cross. That's really nice, isn't it? He fed them, healed them, cared for them, cast out demons, and they nailed him to a cross. I don't know about you, but that'd make me a little bitter. Jesus served people for their good and intrinsic, the inward value, not for what people could bring to him. We can bring nothing to him. You see, in love means, and I get this from Tim Keller. He's becoming my new hero in the faith. Love means to serve a person for their good and intrinsic value, not for what that person brings to you. Get that. Love means to serve a person for their good and intrinsic value, not for what the person brings to you. We are to love people who, don't, who won't love us back. Not who don't, but who won't love us back. We are to serve people who will never serve us. We are to help people who will never help us. If you are a follower of Christ, that's what it means to love others. You love the person you're sitting next to, right? Well, you kind of like them. Right? It's easy to be with them. Right? That's why you're sitting by them. Have you ever sat, sat by an annoying person? Person who drives you crazy? Have you ever? I doubt it. I have. And they drive you crazy. And they're annoying. 
And sometimes I'm the annoying one that's driving them crazy. <laughs> Ask my family around the dinner table. <laughs> you know? It's easy to love that person sitting next to you. That's, I mean, that's love. That's part of it. But are you willing to love someone who won't love you back? Are you willing to serve someone who's not going to serve you all? Are you willing to help someone who can't help you? That is love, is it not? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? He saw the value inside of them. And what did he do? He loved them. Even though they couldn't give anything back to him, they loved, he loved them. Folks, if he's our example, and you call yourself a Christ follower, you have to love people. Now, let me rephrase that. You need to love people. Who annoy you? Do you have any annoying people in your life? Or are you the annoying person in that life, in that relationship? Do you have any? Do you, have, do, you, do you serve anybody who can't serve you? Or pay you back? I'm talking about on a weekly basis, not once a week in September 10 to the 14. Nobody's going to pay us back next week. Nobody. In fact, we're going to spend hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, actually. And we're not going to get anything for it. That drives some of you crazy. Waste of money. Isn't it? But to love, expecting nothing back. That's love. In the life of Jesus Christ, we, you know, we live, in, in Jesus Christ, we see a living example of this fruit of the Spirit. You know, Jesus modeled love, but he did, if you don't read the Scriptures, I encourage you to at least read the Gospels this year, because he, you see a living example of the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus modeled love, but he did so in a way that challenges our culture's understanding of love. You know, in this passage we looked at today, Jesus shows us that love is more than romance. It's more than feeling. Feeling. What's that song? That la, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my wife can sing it. You know? You know, we make it about feelings. And we make it about romance. But fundamentally, love is an action, right? Though you've been married a while. Though you're thinking about it, love is an action. Everything, you just get played it really well. Patience, that's an action, isn't it? You think, oh, God, give me patience. Help me not to kill this kid. You know, help me not to kill him. You know, and we pray those prayers to ourselves instead of praying for ourselves. First John 3.18, which is on the back of those shirts out there, which will be our shirts we wear through the week, says this, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Folks, if you love someone, you are going to serve them. There's no way around it. You can tear out that scripture in your Bible, but it's still true. To love someone, I'm either in a husband, wife, parent, child, friend, what we're doing this next week, building relationships with our community, if we love them, we will serve them. And I hope you take that personally with your neighbor. Or that annoying person at work. Love them. And you love them by serving them. Even though you know you ain't getting anything back. That's the hard part, isn't it? We expect something back. You know, when you get a Christmas card and you didn't mail one, what do you do? 
Just go buy one, you mail it to the person who just sent you one. I gave up that. That's a waste of money. I ain't going to send you, you send me a Christmas card? Thank you. I don't get that many anymore because I don't send any out. <laughs> you know? But still, we think we have to, that's not love. To, to love is to value. Is that intrinsic value of that person. Knowing that they, and doing, serving them, knowing that they can't pay you back. If you love someone, you're going to serve them. In John 13, Jesus demonstrates his love for his disciples by uh, moving straight to where they are least attracted, their feet. Have you ever seen Jonathan Folda's feet? They are this toe. It is the ugliest thing you have ever seen. And if you give him his text number, he'll be glad to text it to you because we see it at least twice a year, you know? But yeah, Jesus went what the most the least attractive of part of these disciples. It was their feet because they were dirty and they were grimy. They had walked. And Jesus went straight to where they are least attractive. And folks, if we're honest, we tend to avoid loving less attractive people, right? We like to love beautiful people so that we can feel better about ourselves. We tend to avoid loving less attractive people. We like to love beautiful people so that we can feel better about ourselves. Those who we tend to avoid, folks, are the ones we need to serve. If someone's annoying and you want to avoid them, ding, 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 that's the Holy Spirit working in you. Love them. Someone does you wrong, stabs you in the back, calls your name and is cruel to you. And you want to avoid them. Ding, 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 ding. Love them. By the way, less attractive people don't have to be good looking or they don't have to be good looking either. Those you want to avoid are the less attractive people. Those who we tend to avoid are the ones we need to serve. You can pray for them all you want. God, help me to love them. That's a good thing to do. I'm not making fun of that. Yeah, I am. I'm making fun of that. So, You can pray for them all you want, but until you serve them, you're not really loving them. You know that. You're not really loving them until you serve them. until you're willing to serve them, until you're willing to get on your knees and wash their feet. You're not loving them. Why do you think Jesus did that? He wanted to show them, hey, this is what it means to love. You think Jesus enjoyed smelling dirty feet? I don't think so. And what did the disciples do to him, do for him? What did they do? They ran away. Isn't that a great friend? When the trouble got going and and everything, the pressure was on, what did they do? They ran away. That just makes you feel good about yourself. After you just wash their feet. And they ran away and abandoned him. And he still died on the cross. If all you do is hang around beautiful people, (laughs) you will never really learn how to love. Do you know that? If all you do is hang around beautiful people, meaning people you enjoy being around, you will never really learn how to love. Again, look at the life of Jesus. He hung around prostitutes, tax collectors, really difficult religious people, demon-possessed, Jesus, his betrayer, and folks, you and I. 
To Jesus, I think, when I read the scriptures, to Jesus, people are people. And everyone deserves, I, everyone deserves, this is my heartbeat, everyone deserves to be loved for their intrinsic value and not for what they can bring to you. Folks, everyone deserves to be loved. And if you're a Christ follower, yes, Jesus, I love you. And a lot of you would raise your hands if I asked that question. Then he says, go love someone else because everyone deserves to be loved for their intrinsic value and not for what they can bring to you. You see, Jesus loves you for your intrinsic value. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that why will you at sinners? He died for us. And folks, he is committed to loving us to the end. He is patient. He is kind with us. He doesn't keep record of our wrongs. He's not rude. And, you know, you heard the, and so on and so on. And he tells us to go and love someone you can't, that can't love back. And to serve someone who will never serve you. And to help someone who will never help you. Commit to loving him and commit to loving others. Because you're just pretending to be a Christ follower if you're not. Yeah. You're just a pretender, a poser, an actor, playing the role of a Christian. That's what love is. And everyone deserves to be loved. Everyone deserves to be loved. Everyone deserves to be loved. If we say we love God and you're not loving others, when you stand before God, he's going to say, sorry. If you're holding a grudge and you can't love someone, you better confess it. Sincerely, God, what a sinner am I. Forgive me for holding that grudge. If you have trouble loving annoying people, you better start figuring out how to do it. You don't love less than attractive people, better figure out how to do it. God's not going to make you do it. He's not a control freak. He wants us to be committed to doing it. 